So we're going into Unit 6 where we're going to discuss chromosomes and different types of cell division. So there's going to be different types of cell division. First off, we're going to have where the normal cell division occurs in eukaryotic cells, and that's going to be referred to as mitosis. Then we're going to talk about cell division in prokaryotes, which is going to be binary fission. Later on, we're going to move on to cell division in gametes, or our sex cells, and that's going to be meiosis. So starting us off, immortal cells can spell trouble, cell division in sickness and in health. So you don't keep the same cells throughout your life. Your cells are going to be constantly changing. They go through so many replications before they finally will go through an apoptosis, which is going to be a regulated or programmed cellular death. So they're continuously reproducing themselves, and the older ones are constantly dying off. The remaining cells that we had left, like I said, are going to go through that mitosis, and they replace themselves. We talked briefly about chromosomes in Unit 5. Now we're going to look at chromosomes a little bit closer. Now at the ends of each chromosome, you're going to have little caps. So we're going to cap each end with a protective um, covering. And these are going to be found on every single tip of every chromosome you have. So every time a cell divides, the telomere is going to get a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter. They're going to actually keep track of how many times that cell has divided. Once it gets to a certain point to where it's been worn down too much, then that cell knows that it is time to go through apoptosis, which is that regulated cellular death. So looking at the picture here, you're going to see these two sister chromatids, or these chromosomes, and at the ends of them, the orange sections are going to be those telomeres. And so with the telomere there, you can look down in the further section, up in, and you'll see starting off that, well, the pendant mark, sorry. Let me try it again. So you'll see starting off that the telomere at first is going to be a lot longer. And so it's actually a section of base pairs that don't really code for anything at all. They're just there as a protective cap or covering. So when the cell divides, it doesn't actually start to have any degradation into the actual DNA that codes for specific things. So over time, as that cell divides and divides and divides, you start to see that that telomere gets worn down. Once the telomere gets worn down too much, you don't want it to actually go into the DNA where it can affect the genes or affect how the body produces the different things that it needs. So therefore, it's going to go through its regulated cellular death. Now, sometimes these telomeres in humans aren't going to be as long as they should be. Usually, they're just going to be a bunch of T's and A's and G's put together. The usual sequence of the nucleotide is TTAGGG. And there's going to be about 2,000 repeats of this, which is going to allow for about 80 to 90 cell divisions per cell. Once it reaches that, then it's going to go through its regulated cell death. So you're going to think that disconnecting the cell's odometer would give a person everlasting youth, but actually it does not. Because remember, that's going to be what keeps that DNA young. It keeps it from going through the different degradation of the DNA as it um goes through mitosis and creates more and more. And so you would think that those telomeres or that odometer would give a person everlasting youth. But like we said, it doesn't. If you disconnect those telomeres, you're going to end up with cancer. So it's not going to know that it needs to stop dividing, and it's not going to stop dividing. It's going to continue to go on and on. And so this is what happens when those telomeres get too short and that cell does not go through apoptosis. Occasionally, you're going to have people that are born with telomeres that are going to be too short to start with. What this is going to do is it's going to impair the function of specific proteins that the body needs and that it makes. People are going to start to age a lot quicker. And in this case, it's going to be rare for them to live beyond the age of 13. It's called progeria. 
On the other hand, they have found that there are people who have longer telomeres than others, and with those longer tel telomeres, it helps protect their DNA, so they tend to age a lot slower, they look a lot younger, and their body holds up a lot longer. So those people are the ones that tend to stay young looking and don't look their age. Exit that. So rebuilding these telomeres. Is it an effective strategy for allowing a cell to function for a longer than normal? Well, for certain cells, telomere rebuilding is going to be essential for things such as sperm and for eggs. That's going to be very important because you do not want the DNA inside of the nucleus of these cells to be degraded at all. You want them to be intact and you want them to be fully functional. Especially with eggs, that's going to be important because the egg's going to be made before the mother's even born. Therefore, whatever egg she has, those are the ones that she's going to actually use to reproduce throughout her life. So if she is 35 years old or if she is 40 years old, that DNA inside of those eggs will be that old. So you need to constantly be able to rebuild those telomeres there. Now with the sperm, it's going to actually do this but it's not going to be quite as important because sperm if it's not used within a certain period of time around a month it does get reabsorbed into the body and the body makes more or it's also made on demand so it's constantly being reproduced and it's uh, newer than the eggs so for most types of cells the telomere rebuilding present presents a big problem the problem is that these cells are not going to stop dividing. And when a cell doesn't stop dividing, we know that as cancer. So in summary, cell division is going to be an ongoing process in most organisms and their tissues. Disruptions to normal cell division can have serious consequences. For example, in eukaryotic cells, a protective section of DNA called the telomere at each end of every chromosome is going to play an important role in keeping track of cell division and getting shorter every time that cell divides. So remember, think of it kind of like an odometer. It's going to count how many times that cell divides, and once it gets to a specific number, usually 80 or 90, but it could be even as few as 50 divisions, that's when it's going to be pre-programmed for cellular um, death. So if a telomere becomes too short, additional cell division will cause the loss of essential DNA and cell death. Cells that rebuild their telomeres with each division can become cancerous. So like we said, with the longer telomeres, people tend to not age as quickly, but you don't want to keep rebuilding them to the point that they become cancer. So some chromosomes are going to be circular, where others are going to be linear. And we've talked a little bit about this in earlier units. All organisms are going to use DNA or some form of DNA. All DNA is going to be organized into chromosomes. Now those chromosomes might be straight lines or in strings, or they could be in a circular form. So looking here at this picture, notice the prokaryotic cells. That's going to be things like your bacteria and your archaea. These are going to have a singular circular chromosome. That chromosome is just floating around in the cytoplasm. It's not going to be in a nucleus. Sometimes you'll have extra little sections of genes that are going to be found inside the cytoplasm as well floating around. Remember, those were called plasmids. Looking on over at the eukaryotic cell, it's going to be a linear chromosome. With this, depending on what type of animal, it could be any number of chromosomes. For example, with humans, you're going to have 46 of these linear strands floating around in the cytoplasm. Uh, not cytoplasm, not the cytoplasm, but the nucleus. Also, notice that the DNA is going to be twisted around proteins, and these proteins are going to keep that chromatin from kind of getting tangled up, and those proteins are referred to as histones. Here is a picture of a prokaryote. This one specifically is going to be a rod-shaped bacteria. It has its circular DNA inside, and it will go through cell division through a process called binary fission. DNA first is going to replicate into two identical circular chromosomes. 
The parent cell is going to start to elongate and eventually starts to pinch in in the center and eventually pinches apart. You end up with two daughter cells at the end. So the cell you started out with would be a parent cell. The cells you end up with in the end are called daughter cells. This is going to be considered a form of asexual reproduction. So here you see it under a microscope. Over to the right hand side, you see how that chromosome, first thing, it's going to double up and make two copies. Those two copies are then going to start to separate out. Then each copy is going to go to either one end or the other. And then it starts to elongate, pull apart, pinches in in the center, and eventually divides. Now with that type of division, it will be a identical cloning of the original cell. And so binary or asexual reproduction does make an identical cell. So in most bacteria and archaea, the genetic information is going to be carried in a single circular chromosome, a strand of DNA that is attached at one site to the cell membrane. Eukaryotes have much more DNA than do bacteria and organized in a linear chromosome within the nucleus. Bacteria divide by a type of asexual reproduction called binary fission. First, the circular chromosome is going to duplicate itself, then the parent cell splits into two new genetically identical daughter cells. There is going to be a time for everything in the eukaryotic cell cycle. Most eukaryotic cells are going to go through specific phases during the cell cycle. They spend most of their time with activities related to growth. Then they're going to go into a period of cell division where they create two new daughter cells from a parent cell. So two types of cells starting out with the eukaryotic cell. You have what's referred to as the somatic cell. These are going to be cells that form the body of the organism. These will go through mitosis for cell division. So for somatic cells, these are going to be things like skin cells, um, any type of organ cell, blood cells, any type of body cell is referred to as a somatic cell. You do need to know that. Reproductive cells are going to be your second type of cell. These are referred to as your gametes. They are your sex cells. These are going to be the egg and the sperm. They're actually going to use a type of cell division referred to as meiosis. Now with the cell cycle for the average somatic cell, you're going to have alteration of activities between growth and cell division. Here you're going to see the different phases. So the two main phases are going to be interphase and the mitotic phase. Interphase not only is going to be the growth phase, but it's also going to be the phase where the cell is just doing its job. It spends most of its time in this phase, anywhere, well, depending on what type of cell, anywhere from 80 to 90% of its life is going to be spent in interphase. If it's something such as a brain cell or a nerve cell, it might spend even longer than that in its interphase state. So before it goes through mitosis. So with this mitotic phase, once it reaches that, it's going to go through four phases alone. Interphase, it goes through three phases. And then the third phase is going to be cytokinesis, and that's simply going to be cytoplasm division. That's where it finally splits apart. So going into it, looking at this eukaryotic cell, you're going to first start out with the interphase state, and it's actually divided up into three phases itself, G1, S, and G2. G1, referred to as gap 1, or depending on what book you use, sometimes it's referred to as growth 1 phase. The cell's primary growth phase is going to be where the normal cellular functions take place. It's making proteins, it's getting rid of waste, it's doing whatever its job is, depending on where it's located within the body. There is a specific phase that it can go into, which is kind of a resting cycle where it just does its job and does not go through the cell cycle. It just does its job. And that's going to be referred to as the G0 phase. So some cells are going to pause in the G1 and enter that resting phase and just do their job. They can do this for days or even stay in this phase for years. 
If it does not go into the G0 phase, it's going to go to the S phase, S4 synthesis phase. This is where the cell is going to begin to prepare for cellular division. It's going to make um, double the DNA or chromosomes. So if it started out like with a human with 46 chromosomes, it's going to have 92 by the end of this phase. So it's going to double up and replicate its chromosomes. Then once all that's ready, it's going to go into G2 phase. This is the second period of growth and preparation for cell division. Here it's going to check to make sure that it has enough organelles to create two cells and it's going to double up on its cytoplasm and everything else. Once it's ready and it has everything in, it, in excess, then it's going to start the mitotic phase. Here it's going to go through mitosis. So that cell that starts out is referred to as the parent cell. It's actually going to have the nucleus start to break down and you'll see the nuclear contents and then the different organelles move to one side or the other where it eventually splits apart during cytokinesis. So with the cell cycle, there is going to be a control system that regulates the rate of cell division. It's actually made up of a group of molecules which are going to be mostly proteins and is going to go through specific checkpoints. These checkpoints are going to be important to make sure everything is functioning properly. Then you have what's referred to as growth factors. These are going to be signals that trigger things such as transition. They help provide the cell with feedback to let it know if division is appropriate or if it needs to stay in a resting phase. Those checkpoints that it has are going to help regulate the um, cell cycle are going to be G between the G1 and S phase, between the G2 and mitotic phase, and, and during the spindle assembly checkpoint. So looking here, this just shows you the different checkpoints that we have. So between the G1 and S checkpoint, it's going to look and check through the DNA and see if there's any damage to the DNA. It's also going to see, does the cell have sufficient nutrients? Does it have what it needs? Then it's going to go through S phase into G2, but before it enters the mitotic phase, it's going to check, has the DNA replicated properly? Do we have what we need? If it does, it's going to allow it into the mitotic phase. From that mitotic phase, once it goes through the specific um, phases there, it will then hit the spindle assembly checkpoint. And here it's going to check that the spindle fibers are properly built and attached. So these are going to be critical points that a cell needs in its cell cycle to help it um, stop going through mitosis if it is not prepared. It will only allow it to go through mitosis and to divide if everything is right. So eukaryotic somatic cells alternate in cell cycle between cell division and other, other cellular activities. The cell division portion of the cycle is going to be called the mitotic phase. The remainder of the cell cycle, called interphase, is going to consist of two gap phases separated by a DNA synthesis phase. A cell cycle control system functions through a series of checkpoints. These are going to be critical points in the cell cycle at which progress is going to be blocked and cells are going to be prevented from dividing until specific signals are going to trigger that continuation of the process. Now cell division is going to be preceded by chromosome replication. So how this happens, you're going to have complementary base pairing that's going to make it possible to produce two identical strands by separating the parent molecule and using each strand as a template. So it will separate the two parent molecules, and then you'll have free-floating nucleotides found in the nucleoplasm, which are going to come up and match in. So the darker sides are going to be the sides that were in the parent strand of DNA. The inner portion is going to be part of the new strand. And notice how it comes in and bonds with its complement. So A's will bond with T's, T's with A's, C's with G's, and G's with C's. At the end, you will have two identical daughter DNA molecules. So looking at that sugar phosphate backbone structure, each of the five carbon atoms in the sugar molecule will be numbered. Notice how it's numbered. It's going to start off with the sides. It's going to be closer towards the bases. 
And so you'll have number one carbon, then number two, number three in the corner, coming up the side of the rung is gonna be number four, and then the top is number five that attaches onto the phosphate group. Now, each new nucleotide can be added only to the OH connecting the um, three carbon. So we say that a DNA strand has a 5N and a 3N, and it can only grow from its 5N to its 3N. So it can only replicate that way. In order to replicate, what it's got to do is unwind and separate to start it off. So replication begins at a specific site called an origin of replication. Molecules are going to unwind and separate into two strands, like a zipper unzipping. Remember, it's going to unzip at that weak hydrogen bond in the center where the bases are. In prokaryotes, they're going to have a single origin. Eukaryotes can have multiple origins at different sites within the chromosome. The enzyme called DNA helicase is going to be what does the unwinding of the DNA. It separates those two strands and where it's separating them is going to be a place called a replication fork. So looking at this in this picture, you see the DNA helicase going down the strand of DNA. It's going to break those hydrogen bonds and create what's known as a replication fork. That's where it's coming apart. Then you're going to have two parent strands, one on each side, and then you start to see the new strand forming in the center. This is called reconstruction and elongation. So these enzymes connect the appropriate nucleotides to the growing new strand. First, it's synthesizing a short primer of RNA nucleotides complementary to the exposed bases, and then it adds the DNA nucleotides later by replacing the primer RNA nucleotides with DNA. As the replication is completed at each of the two strands from the parent DNA molecule, now you're going to have two identical cells with double-stranded DNA. So with that reconstruction and elongation, each single strand becomes a double strand. You have that appropriate complementary base that has matched up, and it runs from the 3 to 5 in, so each runs opposite. That's just looking at it again. So DNA proofreading and error correction. Errors sometimes occur in DNA when it duplicates itself. Why might that be a good thing? Well, sometimes these mistakes can actually code for something that's going to be beneficial. DNA is going to have a proofreading and error correction mechanism that's going to be able to go through and check the DNA after it's replicated itself. So the daughter molecules are not completely identical. Very low rates sometimes are going to actually put the wrong base in to match with the existing base. So it's not actually a complement. This can be referred to as a mutation. So this is how mutations occur. DNA can also be damaged, and so a mutation can occur. DNA polymerase is going to be an enzyme that runs along the new strands of DNA that were made and is going to read these strands. It's going to look for any errors that don't belong. It looks for these bases that don't match up. So for example, an A with a C or a G with a T. It's going to catch these errors, it's going to remove them, and it's going to replace them with the proper complementary base. If the error remains, that sequence will be different from that parent molecule. The production is going to be different when it goes in to copy it during transcription and translation to make that mRNA. And so therefore, the transcription makes different RNA, the translation makes a different protein. In eukaryotic cells, however, this is going to be very low, specifically with DNA. Because of this DNA helicase, it's going to, or DNA polymerase, sorry, it's going to be able to go in there and it's going to be able to read it and fix it. But if it doesn't fix it, this is what leads to evolution. This is what leads to changes in our genome. So in summary, every time a cell divides, that cell's DNA must first duplicate itself so that each of the two new daughter cells has all the genetic material of the original parent cell. The process of DNA duplication is called replication. 
and is going to be catalyzed by several important enzymes and occurs in two steps. The first step being unwinding and separation of the two strands, and then reconstruction and elongation of the new complementary strands. Every time a cell divides, that cell's DNA must first duplicate itself so that each of the two new daughter cells has all the genetic material that the original parent cell had. The process of DNA duplication is going to be referred to as replication. Sorry, went back on me. All right, most cells are not immortal. Mitosis is going to generate replacements for these cells. So the need for new cells is going to be important, whether it's a new plant growing from a seedling, and we can see mitosis in these um, root tips, specifically onion root tips are a great place to look at the cell division. And then you can see it in humans as well. If you are shaving, lots of times you do damage the upper layer of skin, and so therefore it has to go in and it has to replace that layer. So mitosis is going to be very important in replacing old worn out cells with fresh new duplicates. The chromatin is going to resemble spaghetti until it's ready to divide. So remember, it's in a long stringy form inside that nucleus. Once it gets ready to divide, it's going to condense itself down and make the X shape of the chromosome. So each sister chromatid is going to be a chromosome or one side of the chromosome. So with mitosis, it's just going to have one purpose. It's going to be able to take existing cells and generate new identical cells. The reason we need to generate these new identical cells is for growth and for replacement. Apoptosis, we've talked about a little bit already. That's going to be a pre-planned process of cell suicide. So this is going to be cellular death. Certain cells are going to be targeted for apoptosis. These cells are going to be ones that accumulate significant genetic damage over time, which makes them a high risk for becoming cancerous. And cells that line the digestive tract and the liver because they are constantly being bombarded or being exposed to harmful substances. Depending on where the cell is located depends on how often it divides. So different cells in different body parts will have different rates of cell division. For example, bone marrow is going to be rapidly dividing. It replaces the red blood cells. On average, um, red blood cells are going to be in circulation for only about two to four months. Then they're going to get replaced. So around 120 days is the average life of a red blood cell. Intestine cells are going to be replaced about every three weeks. Also, cells that line the mouth are going to be replaced very frequently, anywhere from two to three weeks. So looking at this, this is going to be your red blood cell. Remember, it's a nucleate, which means it does not have a nucleus inside. What happens is when it starts off, it is going to have a nucleus inside, but right before it finishes its maturity, it ejects that nucleus and becomes a biconcave mature red blood cell. So mitosis is going to enable existing cells to generate new genetically identical cells. This is going to make it possible for organisms to grow and replace cells that die. So going through an overview of mitosis, we start off with the parent cell, kind of like we started off with the parent DNA or the parent strand. It's going to be living its life and doing its thing, performing whatever job it performs, wherever it's located. That's going to be its interface. Then it reaches a point where it's ready to divide. So it's going to enter the mitotic phase. And so it goes through mitosis. Chromosomes condense, spindle fibers start to form, the chromosomes line up, they get pulled apart towards each pole. The cytoplasm starts to pinch in as the cells elongate and cytokinesis occurs where you end up with two daughter cells. So for mitosis to begin, the parent cell must replicate its DNA. And this is gonna occur during S phase of interphase. Chromosomes replicate and make two identical linear DNA strands. The two DNA molecules are going to be held together 
in the center region with a um, section called a centromere. And so you have your DNA that you see through here. And so it's going to duplicate or replicate itself and make another one. And so then you're going to put those together and that's going to make that chromosome you're used to seeing because it's going to go through cell division. So you need a copy of each and it's held together in the center with that centromere. Each one of those sides is going to be referred to as a sister chromatid. So chromosomes during the cell cycle, except through mitosis, eukaryotic chromosomes are going to be uncoiled. They're going to spend their time open and kind of like that spaghetti form floating around inside of the nucleus. Then when it comes time for rep replication, that chromosome is going to condense and it's going to duplicate itself. Once it does that, it's going to be held together in the center with that centromere. And this is just going to be a um, microscopic picture of two cells going through mitosis and dividing. The spindle is going to be important. It's composed of proteins, mostly hollow tubes called microtubules. The spindle microtubules are going to stretch across the cell between its two ends or between the poles. In animal cells, the threads or the spindle fibers are going to connect at each pole to a structure referred to as the centriole, and these are only going to be found in animals. So the details of mitosis is going to be a four-step process. First, we have our interface. That's going to be where we have preparation for mitosis and the chromosomes replicate. Then you have your prophase. You start to see that nuclear membrane break down. The sister chromatids have replicated during, and they have come together. They're held together in the center with that centromere. They are condensed, so they do look like X's. And you start to see the centrioles go into one side or the other, which we refer to as poles. And you see the spindle fiber coming out. Next, it goes into metaphase. Think of meta and middle. So it lines up across the equator of the cell. The centrioles are definitely at each pole by this point. You see the spindle fibers coming out, and it's going to attach to each chromosome or sister chromatid at that centromere. Then it goes into anaphase. Where the spindle fiber is attached at those centromeres, it's going to start to shorten and it's going to pull the chromosome to either one side or the other. When it does this, it does start to elongate. And so you see that cell elongating, but it also starts to pinch in here. That pinching in is referred to as a cleavage furrow. So cleavage furrow. You also start to see the nucleus reform around the DNA, and it starts to go back into its chromatin form. So it goes from a condensed form back into a loose spaghetti-like form. So cell division is going to be out of control when it results in things like cancer. So lots of times you think about people in your family and think about has anyone in your family been affected by cancer or anyone that you know? Most of us are going to say yes. Cancer is going to be defined as an unrestrained cell growth and division. It can damage the adjacent tissues and some can even metastasize. Now with metastasizing, this is going to be when it's able to move to other parts of the body and it's going to form cancerous tumors in those other sections of the body. It can cause very serious health problems and in second leading cause of death in the United States. So with these cancer cells, first thing, they're going to lose their contact inhibition. And we've talked about this a little bit back when we talked about cells. Normal cells are going to divide until they come in contact with other cells near them. Once they come in close contact, they have what they refer to as contact inhibition, and so they will stop growing. At that point, they don't want to divide anymore because they don't want to be on top of each other. Cancer cells, however, are going to ignore this contact inhibition, and they're going to continue to divide until they start to pile up on each other and become high density. Cancer cells lose their contact inhibition. That's what causes them to do it. They also can divide indefinitely. 
cancer cells are going to have a reduced stickiness to them. So that means they don't stick to each other well as well as non-cancer cells. Non-cancer cells can stick to themselves well and stay in a specific area. With cancer cells, they don't do that, so that's how they move around the body very easily and metastasize. So looking at this picture, you see a petri dish growing normal cells, and then you see a petri dish growing cancerous cells, and you see how they grow on top of each other and form a lump. You have two different types of cancer or how you can refer to cancer tumors. You have what's referred to as benign and malignant. Benign tumors are going to be those like moles, warts, or just masses of normal cells that don't spread around the body. They can usually be removed safely without any lasting consequences. However, you could have a type which is referred to as a malignant tumor. These are going to be cancerous growing and they continuously shed and they can travel around the body. This is going to cause them to set up home or set up shop in different organs or different areas of the body. And then that's going to cause tumors in those areas. Lots of times with benign tumors, they're going to be encapsulated. So they don't move around the body. And so when they go to remove that tumor or that growth, they also remove that capsule. And here it's just looking at cancer that has metastasized. And so all the areas that you see in white are going to be where that tumor had separated and traveled around the body and started other tumors. So what is cancer and how does it usually cause death? Well, like we said, cancer is going to be the uninhibited growth of cells and the cells basically quit doing their job. It doesn't mean that they require a lot less energy though they do still require quite a bit of energy. So they start to use up the body's energy that it would normally use in other parts that would help take care of the body. So as it gets larger, it's gonna take up more and more space. Eventually, it can even block neighboring cells from doing their job. It could kill those cells that it's gonna be close to. Also, those cells are going to have a dysfunction or with the cell death that interrupts critical functions of life. For example, it can interrupt breathing if it's going to be in the lung tissue or it can interrupt the heartbeat. So here, a malignant tumor is going to develop in a patient's lung tissue. As the tumor gets larger, it's going to take up more and more space and it's going to press up against neighboring cells and tissue. And so notice here how it's starting to block that blood vessel. And if it blocks the blood vessels, it's not going to be able to exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. And so it's going to start to starve out those tissues. Some ways that we help to treat cancer is by using different forms such as chemotherapy or radiation. We also go in and try to remove the cancerous mass. With radiation, it's going to disrupt the cell division. What it does is it directs high energy radiation on a part of the body that's going to be infected. Now, if somebody goes through chemotherapy, they're going to take drugs that are going to interfere with cell division, um, and it's going to help slow down the growth of those tumors. However, it is going to circulate through the entire body, so it doesn't just target the tumor cells, it does target other cells and cause cell death. So this is why people who go through chemotherapy become very ill, why they lose their hair, and um, become very weak. So cancer is going to be an unrestrained cell growth and cell division, which can lead to large masses of cells that may cause serious health problems. It's often going to result from mutations in genes important in controlling the cell cycle, thus reducing the effectiveness of its checkpoints. Treatment's going to focus on killing or slowing down the fast growing and dividing cells and usually involves things like chemotherapy or radiation. Meiosis is going to generate sperm and egg cells and a great deal of variation. So we talked about mitosis, that was within somatic cells or body cells. Now we're moving on to the gametes. So sexual reproduction is going to require special cells, and these cells are made through meiosis. So with reproduction, there's going to be two ways that an organism can reproduce. 
It can either reproduce sexually or asexually. Sexually is going to be how most animals and plants reproduce. So basically what happens, they're going to take two cells, usually a male and female cell, that will come together in fertilization. If it's asexual, this is going to be how things such as bacteria, fungi, some plants and animals, and some protists are going to be able to um, go through a cellular division where a single parent can produce a identical offspring or like a clone. Some species, like in plants, can do both depending on what it needs to do. Sexual reproduction is going to take DNA from two different parents and is going to produce a genetically unique offspring. So if it's asexual, it's going to be the same DNA. If it's sexual, it's going to be its own specific unique DNA. And it's going to do this by going through meiosis. So sexually reproducing organisms have evolved a way to avoid the chromosome overload. Meiosis is going to be a process that enables organisms prior to fertilization to make special reproductive cells called gametes. When it does this, it's going to reduce the number of chromosomes from 46 to 23. So with these gametes, they're only going to have half the amount of DNA that the regular somatic or body cells have. So like we said, 23 chromosomes if it's a human. Diploid cells are going to have two copies of each chromosome, and those are referred to as somatic cells. So lots of times you'll see this as a 2N. That means two copies of the chromosome. If it's haploid, it will be a 1N. And so that's where it has one copy. Those are always going to be your gametes. So with sexual reproduction, notice how you're going to get one chromosome from mom and one from dad for each one of the 23 chromosomes. When you do this, you're putting in 23 from each parent and you end up with your nice 46 chromosomes total. When they come together, we have our fertilized egg and lots of times it's referred to as 23 pairs or 46 single chromosomes. For example, you're going to have one of chrom or two of chromosome one, two of chromosome two, and so forth. And that creates the offspring. So meiosis is going to achieve more than just a reduction in the amount of genetic material in gametes. You're going to have two copies or two alleles of every gene. So meiosis is going to reduce the number so you get one copy of each allele from each parent. And here we have three brothers. If you know these people, you would know that these are the Kennedys. So even though they are brothers, they're closely related, they look alike, they are all still going to be genetically different. So they come from two, the same two parents, but they end up with genetically unique DNA, and that's going to be because of meiosis. So it has two important outcomes. It reduces the amount of genetic material in gametes because we don't want 46 in a sperm and 46 in an egg. Then you would end up with an individual that has 92 chromosomes. So we need to reduce it. That's where meiosis comes in. And it's going to produce gametes that are all going to be different from each other with respect to the combination of the alleles that they carry. So in summary, meiosis is going to be a process by which reproductive cells are produced in sexual reprodu reproducing organisms. It results in gametes that have only half as much genetic material as the parent cell and that differ from one another in the combination of alleles that they carry. With our next um, video, we're going to pick up with actually going through meiosis and then we're going to talk about different types of genetic deformities.